far yesterday as I had planned, so I'm going to pick up um, where I left off. And uh, so uh, hopefully uh, this morning what I'll be able to get through is um, finish talking about uh, you know, the uh, quantum Hall effect and the churn number, do that kind of fast, and then talk about topological insulators. Okay, so, um, so the, the main lessons from uh, last time were first the idea of topological states that, you, um, that are characterized by maybe some topological invariant and you can't um, get from one to the other without uh, crossing a gap, um, or without the gap closing. Um, uh, and then we um, uh, did this example in one dimension where we recognized that the um, electric polarization in one dimension is closely related to the Berry phase of the occupied um, uh, block states. And, um, and we wrote down this model, the Sue Schrieffer Heger model, which um, uh, uh, provided we imposed some extra symmetries, either the chiral symmetry or the reflection symmetry, um, had topological, uh, distinct topological phases, okay, which we could uh, sort of understand. Um, uh, um, but if we didn't have any extra symmetry, then, uh, then, then every one-dimensional insulator is the same as every other one-dimensional insulator. There are no topological classes. Okay, so there's a sense in which, um, in one dimension, there's no topological, you know, there's nothing uh, topological if you don't have any uh, symmetries. But what I want to do um, first is I want to tell you about a, situ uh, a one-dimensional situation where there is uh, topology, and this is um, an important uh, example which um, I think we can uh, understand, and this is uh, the, um, the Thales charge pump. So, so if I have a one-dimensional insulator, um, then what I can imagine doing is I can imagine considering an adiabatic cycle where um, I, I change the Hamiltonian in time through some periodic uh, orbit. Okay? And so I want to imagine a Hamiltonian now which is a function of k, but it's also a function of, of, an, of another parameter which I can call time, um, uh, and it's uh, periodic. And so the simple picture that I want you to um, uh, have in your head is just um, you know, the nearly free electron gas where I have uh, uh, electrons which are locked in a periodic potential. Okay? And then as a function of time, I can just slide that periodic potential over by uh, one space. Okay? And in doing so, it's obvious that what I do is I pump an electron um, from one end to the other. Okay? And so, um, so I'd like to think about uh, how we can uh, characterize that. And so, so clearly, um, what has changed um, uh, in going from the start to the finish is you've changed the, um, uh, the electric polarization. Now, the Hamiltonian has come back uh, to where it started. Okay, so the Hamiltonian is the same at the beginning and at the end, but the polarization has changed. And so, like I said, we can characterize the polarization um, by the, um, the Berry phase, okay? And so I can compute the change in the polarization um, as the difference between the Berry phase um, at the beginning and the Berry phase at the end of the cycle, okay? Now, the thing we know is that the Hamiltonian at the beginning and the end is the same. So, the, um, so, the, so there's a sense in which the Berry phases have to be the same, except the Berry phase is only defined uh, a, a modulo an integer. It has this intrinsic ambiguity, okay? And so the interesting thing then is if this change then uh, can be an integer. And so now, of course, um, we can write the change in the Berry phase um, uh, uh, as uh, we can use Stokes' theorem to write that um, as the uh, integral over the entire um, two-dimensional uh, uh, plane here, okay, of the curl of the, uh, of the Berry uh, connection. So, so this is manifestly uh, gauge invariant, and the, um, the thing is, though, is that it's guaranteed that it has to be an integer, okay? So this integral of the flux over the entire surface, where now, since I can, since, since uh, you know, this line and this line are really the same, I can think of this entire space as being now like the surface of a, of a, of a, of a donut. Okay, it's like a torus. Okay? And so the integral of, the, of, of this Berry curvature over the entire torus is guaranteed to be an integer, okay? and this, is the, this integer is the churn number. Okay? So, um, so, so uh, um, uh, and again, it's, it's very instructive to think about this in the context of this simple model, this two-level uh, Hamiltonian, 
where, again, I can think of the Hamiltonian as being um, uh, uh, described by a, uh, a vector d dotted into a Pauli matrix. And so now this vector d is going to be a function of both k and t. And I told you that the Berry phase you can think of is just the solid angle. That the Berry phase on any loop is just the solid angle swept out by d. And so what that means is that um, uh, what this uh, churn number is, is it is just um, uh, adding up the uh, total, uh, you know, it's counting the number of times this d vector um, wraps around the sphere. Okay, and so, so, so that's a sort of a simple picture of this uh, uh, topological invariant. It's just a winding number, you know, winding number for the, from, um, for, you know, the map from the uh, torus onto the sphere. It's the number of times it wraps around. Okay, and it's obvious that has to be um, an integer. Okay, so this is a simple way of thinking about the churn number. And so this, um, uh, uh, this understanding of the churn number can, can be um, now uh, applied to um, understand the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. And to, uh, to do that, the connection between this picture and the integer quantum Hall effect is um, uh, a sort of a beautiful um, argument. Very, yeah, question. Uh, is there a metallic state? No, 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 there's a gap the whole time. So, so as I, so you're saying as I'm, as I'm advancing T, then um, no, the, the, the gap stays open the whole time. Okay, because, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah. So, the, so what, this, uh, what this churn number is characterizing, it's not characterizing the Hamiltonian at any particular time. It is characterizing the family of Hamiltonians parameterized by t. And for every value of k and t, um, uh, there's a gap. Okay. Sorry, this is a torus in kt plane. Huh? Uh, this is a torus in kt plane. Yes, that's right. No, 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 they're not in the same direction because, because I'm taking the difference of the polarization afterwards and before. Okay, and so this would be zero if it were not, so okay, this is an important thing. So, so um, uh, uh, if, if, um, uh, if, if my uh, wave function u was um, defined continuously, over the entire uh, 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 torus, then obviously this line and this line are the same line, so these two would be equal to each other. Okay, you know, I just, I just be, you know, this one would just cancel out this one, and this, and so this n would be equal to zero. So what this tells you is that having a non-zero value of n is an obstruction to defining the um, wave function uh, continuously throughout the entire um, uh, uh, parameter space, okay? And so, so, um, and, and so that's sort of an uh, important, you know, a consequence of having a non-zero turn number. It's an obstruction to uh, choosing this continuously everywhere, okay? Yes? Defects? Yeah. What kind of defects? Do I have a gap? So, so if, if, I have a, if I continue to have a gap, um, then I think the picture doesn't change. Yeah. Yes? If I took two families of Hamiltonians, one where I shift one unit of charge to the right in this, in this period, and one where I shift two units of charge to the right in this period, and I try to, I want to say, adiabatically connect the two, or like find family transformations from one to the other, do I have to pass through a gapless state? Yeah, I think so. I mean, so you can't change one to two continuously. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, so for the quantum Hall effect, there's this very deep and beautiful argument, which is is nice and simple, um, uh, uh, which originally was uh, due to Bob Laughlin. And and so the so the idea is the following. So. Um, so let's imagine that I have a, uh, a gapped system, a two-dimensional system that, that is gapped, 
Okay, and I, in, I, I have in mind uh, thinking of it as a, the uh, quantum Hall state, okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine um, uh, putting this system um, with periodic boundary conditions going around in one direction. So, so, so it's like I'm wrapping it onto a, um, a cylinder, okay? And so then uh, what I'm free to do is I am free to apply magnetic flux down the uh, hole of the cylinder, okay? And so what Laughlin um, uh, considered doing was what, what happens if you um, adiabatically turn the flux up from zero to the quantum of magnetic flux H over E, okay? Now, the thing that's special about the uh, magnetic flux quantum H over E, now, of course, the, um, the magnetic field is not anywhere where the uh, electrons are. So the electrons don't see the magnetic field. They only couple to the vector potential of the, um, you know, the, um, that's uh, on the cylinder. And so what that means is that when the flux is H over E, you can do a gauge transformation where you just change the phase of the electrons in a way that advances by 2 pi, do a large gauge transformation, which, um, which uh, eliminates this, um, this H over E flux. So, so, in the, so the process of, um, of adiabatically advancing the flux by H over E um, is just like a thallus pump. Okay, so, so you've, you've come back to where you started. Okay, and so the question then is, um, uh, so viewing this cylinder as a one-dimensional system, um, uh, then you could imagine that um, uh, uh, a charge could be transferred from one end to the other. And now that is exactly what happens um, in the integer quantum Hall effect, because in the integer quantum Hall effect, um, uh, you have a, a, a Hall conductivity. And so let's think about what happens when you, when you turn up the magnetic flux. So when you're changing the magnetic flux, then, um, then uh, Faraday's law tells you that you have an electric field uh, that goes around. Okay, um, so you know you know the curl of the magnetic uh, curl of the electric field is minus d v d t, right? And so um, so so that tells you you have an electric field going around the cylinder. And since you have a Hall conductivity, that means that there is a current proportional to um, to that electric field and 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 sigma x y. Okay, and so in the process of um, of, of turning the flux up from zero to H over E then, um, there is a net flow of charge from this end to this end. And you can, you can calculate it just by integrating the current over time, um, over the time. And, and what you uh, learn by doing that is that you just get sigma xy times H over E. Okay? Yes? I'm not talking about that magnetic field. I'm talking about, yeah, so, so then there would be, mag so that magnetic field would be coming out. Um, but, but, but I don't necessarily have to have a uniform magnetic field coming out. I just want to imagine that I have a two-dimensional two -dimensional state, um, uh, uh, which, um, you know, it could be in a, in a uniform perpendicular magnetic field, but we'll see that you don't have to have a uniform perpendicular two-dimensional two magnetic field. All you need is you have to have a broken time reversal symmetry. You have to, it has to know whether it's plus or minus, but um, uh, you don't need to have a, a uniform uh, perpendicular magnetic field in order to have a long haul state. So, so, so the point is this magnetic flux, the, the flux that I'm talking about is not that magnetic field. It's a magnetic field which, um, where the magnetic field never, um, you know, crosses the electrons, okay? All right. Good. Okay. So, so what this tells us is that given a sigma xy, the change in, you know, the, the charge that gets pumped or the change in the polarization of this one-dimensional system um, has got to be sigma xy times, um, times h over e. And so what we know is that since we're coming back to where we started, the, the, ol you know, the only thing you could do is transfer an integer number of electrons. Okay, and so, um, so that tells you immediately that sigma xy um, uh, has to be an integer multiple of e squared over h. And in fact, this integer n um, is the churn number k 
characterizing this one-dimensional Thoulis pump, which is parameterized by the uh, magnetic flux. Okay, so this is a way we can um, sort of understand the churn number characterizing the two-dimensional quantum Hall effect in terms of the churn number characterizing this uh, one-dimensional uh, Thales pump. Okay, now what is useful to do, so in order to, uh, to make this um, uh, uh, be a, a sort of more clearly related to the, uh, to the band structure of the two-dimensional insulator, what is useful to do is to consider this cylinder to be just one unit cell wide, okay? So I can imagine it's made out of, you know, my uh, crystal, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose one of the directions of the crystal and have periodic boundary conditions just over one unit cell, okay? And so, um, yeah. Ah, yes. That's a very good question. So, so of course, in the fractional quantum Hall state, you know that you can have a Hall conductivity, which is, say, one-third of E squared over H. Okay? And that contradicts the theorem that I just proved to you that says that the uh, Hall conductivity can only be integer multiples of E squared over H. Okay, so that's a puzzle. So there must be some um, uh, assumption that I am making here which is violated in the uh, integer quantum Hall effect. And the assumption that, um, that I am making um, is that the ground state is unique. Okay, so, um, so which in fact, so in a band theory, of course, it is because the ground state is just filling the valence band and, and the ground state is unique, okay? So what in fact occurs in the fractional quantum Hall state is if you, if you put the fractional quantum Hall state on a, on a torus with periodic boundary conditions, the uh, ground state has a topological degeneracy, okay? And that's, the, that's, the, that's where that argument breaks down. Yes? Um, well, so no, I mean, so, so, uh, so this is in a, so, so, um, so usually you need to have sufficient disorder so that your states are localized, okay? But if you have an energy gap, okay, then, then the states inside the energy gap are automatically localized. You know, if you have a state, if you try to have a state inside the, inside the gap, then it's going to be decaying exponentially, okay? And so, um, so in this sort of band structure in integer quantum Hall effect, which I'm going to be describing, then, um, then, then uh, disorder is not essential. Well, then, 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 then you don't have a, a precisely quantized Hall conductivity. What's that? Well, it's it's when I talked about the um, the uh, uh, adiabatic, um, you know. So when I'm talking about adiabatically threading the magnetic flux, I'm 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 declaring that as I adiabatically tune my system, I'm staying in the same state. Okay, and that's reasonable if my if the state that I'm in is separated by all of the other states by an energy gap that is much bigger than one over the, you know, time that I'm doing my adiabatic transformation in. So if I have, if I have degenerate states, that argument, that breaks down. And so in fact, when I thread the flux, um, uh, by, uh, then, then I'm coming back to a different state. So when I, when I thread H over E flux, um, uh, the state that I uh, am in is not the same state that I, the state that I started in. Okay. subspaces as you vary the parameter and the subspaces themselves close on themselves if, if it's any no but but in order to get back to the same state in the um, in the fractional quantum hall say new equals one-third fractional quantum hall state you have to advance the flux by three finite okay yeah all right okay so um, so this gives us a way of thinking about the uh, about the turn number. Now, so, so if I think of this cylinder as just being a single unit cell, 
Okay, then, so, so, so let's think about what block states are like. So, so when you have the, the, the crystal momentum, what that is telling you is that the wave function um, sort of advances by e to the i k dot the lattice constant when I go by one lattice constant, okay? And so, so